Hi, I'm Mark Peddle, your instructor for environmental communication. Today I'm going to give a lecture entitled Screaming Through the Anthropocene. And the subtitle of the lecture is The Environmental Effects of Anthropogenic Noise on Animal Communication. Now there's two words I've already used that probably need definition for you. The first one is anthropogenic. That simply means human, but you might ask then why don't I use the term human? Well that's because it implies more than direct um, uh, human contact. So for example, it's not just the voice and things that humans do directly that might impact the animal world, but all things human in terms of development, um, engine noise, that kind of thing. You can see a helicopter in the background here. That would be anthropogenic noise. Um, the Anthropocene, so when I said screaming through the Anthropocene, there's another term that you might not all be familiar with. The Anthropocene is a suggested title for this era, one that implies that human effects have been so strong that uh, as opposed to past eras, that this, the, the best way to title this one would be Anthro-Human-Pocene, so this, this era. So for example, we're in this, what's often called the sixth great extinction. So many uh, species have been extinguished because of human factors that this could be called the Anthropocene. All right, uh, so what does animal communication have to do with this week's chapter? To be honest with you, the first answer is very little. And I wanted to use this as one example of, of other issues in environmental communication that don't necessarily enter into the textbook. Robert Cox would be one of the first people to say that you can't put everything in a textbook on a given subfield, especially one that's as interdisciplinary and diffuse as environmental communication. So I would argue that human disruption of animal communication, because it affects biodiversity and so many things as you'll see, is probably one of those that is worth discussing. The other th way in which you might connect is that human production and consumption which has as a byproduct noise and sound, something that we often don't look at as much as material effects like toxins, also impact the world in the same way that the chapter discusses greenwashing and overconsumption and how those um, issues might have ecological effects, including deleterious or negative uh, environmental effects. So what do we know? Well, uh, we do know that several bird species increase volume in loud urban environments in compared to their forest or, or non-urban environment. Some increase frequency as well. When I use the word frequency here, what I'm referring to is what humans perceive of as pitch. So when you think of notes on a scale and, and rising in pitch, it's the same idea when I, when I use the word frequency, which technically is a more accurate term. Uh, Dowling et al., um, their research shows that minimum song frequency, that is the lowest pitch that they'll use in a song, increases in a loud urban environment. Similarly, Slabicorn et al., in this case using data from Nemeth and Brune, have also demonstrated that uh, singing higher may matter. Singing higher in a loud environment, so the, the, the volume is loud in ambient noise, and so a higher pitch will cut through better for these birds, so that they're having to react to the loud urban environment. I do want to suggest that you read a lot of the work by Slavicorn et al., including um, that's been published since this 2012 piece, because they probably advanced the field more than anybody. Let's look at a little bit of the data, and it gets a little bit complicated, um, but I'm, I want to step you through at least one to understand what this data tells us and what it does not. And I think both of those things are important because to, if you remember back when we'd studied news reporting of environmental issues, often science is reported in, in sort of uh, hyperbole and absolutes, when in fact the reality as far as the scientific results are more nuanced and complex. So in this case, a lot of the reporting will say that, you know, birds can't hear in urban environments, which isn't exactly accurate. So in this case, for example, out of the six bird uh, species studied, there were statistically significant effects for only two of them. That doesn't mean that it isn't true for all of them. It just means that there's not demonstrable effects for the other ones in the way that these studies are designed. In fact, if we go back to the precautionary principle and think about the way science works, it is a reasonable presupposition 
that in fact a lot of bird species have been affected in this way. And in, in, it would be very difficult to comparatively study the urban environment versus the non-urban environment for all those birds that would have been eliminated for various reasons, one of which might be sound. So let's look at this data. First, we can see here that when, we, and let's just look at the blackbird, for example. In that city context, you notice that they are uh, using more high-pitched songs than low-pitched songs. And their, the maximum distance at which they can communicate is about 60 meters with those high-pitched songs. Now, if we go to their forested context, we instead see that their high-pitched songs are less common than their low-pitched songs because the low-pitched songs can carry just fine without that urban noise. And their maximum communication distance using low-pitched songs is well over 150 meters. So that's a very demonstrable impact in terms of increasing frequency or pitch and also the distance at which they can communicate. Now, why is this important? Well, as when we turn to the question of whales, I'll explain a little bit uh, further. Foraging, reproduction, um, even enculturation of, you know, of youth, of, of baby chicks, is affected if a social species cannot communicate well. And this can in turn influence their reproduction and their success and their ability to um, be sustained in a given ecosystem. But here's another important caveat. You know, it is not all birds. So for example, some birds would not be as social. Others might not use as many communicative cues. And there's some that might do just fine. We know that there's several animals that actually um, do very well around human habitation. When we think about deer, squirrels, pigeons, there's some animals that, uh, cockroaches, that really like human development. Um, so for example, Zhang et al. in China found that spoonbills were completely acclimated to traffic and they could find no effect of traffic noise on their actual um, reproduction and fitness in that environment. So I've just barely touched on birds. There's a lot more to do, but it's also a young field and that's one of the interesting things about it. So if you're interested in sound, it's a fairly open frontier where a lot of acoustic ecology is just starting to get off the ground and because we've been so focused on other sorts of sensory perceptions, such as material toxins and that kind of thing, as opposed to sound, which in some ways is very difficult to study. So let's look at whales for just a second. Parks et al. found that right whales call much louder in when they have increased environmental noise. So once again, we see the same thing as with birds, that the whales have to basically, for all intents and purposes, shout a little bit in order to talk to each other, teach their young, and therefore forage and reproduce all the things that are important to the survival of uh, threatened whale species. And in fact, it's uh, one of those rare cases where they can even often uh, find the point source. So when sonar, ta uh, sonar test takes place, for example, they will see whales literally stop their foraging behavior, just so basically the whale version of standing steel until it's gone so they continue on doing what they do in terms of echolocation and communication. So there's um, fairly impressive work in terms of the effect on whales. Um, I barely scratched the surface here of the various studies. And like I said, it's a young field. Uh, herpetologists, I think, are, are more and more realizing the ways in which sound is impacting um, uh, uh, amphibians and reptiles. Mark B here at the University of Minnesota has a sound lab where he studies uh, frogs and frog communication if you want to get involved in that or know more about that. Another person I mentioned is Bernie Krauss who for years has done uh, uh, acoustic ecology looking at the ways in which various animals fill various sonic niches. So on what's called a spectrograph being able to identify where that bird or other species, what sonic niche they occupy, and how they occupy different ones. And therefore, we might at a certain point gain more complexity as far as how we think about human sound affecting those niches in the same way we deal with the material ecosystems in order to try to preserve species. So there's a lot to be done. Now, this shouldn't be terribly surprising to us as a, as a species of primate that that is extremely affected by sound. 
For example, I've just given you one, one model here. Johnson and Clune in The Dark Side of the Tune uh, found that 500,000, so half a million UK residents move each year due to noise. In other words, they move their entire house, or well, they don't move their house, but they move where they're at because of noise. So we are affected by noise in various ways. And that's just sort of the very kind of gross morphology of what, uh, how it affects us. In terms of our own systems, there's a lot of things noise can do to us if sustained noise happens. It's not just hearing loss, it's other sort of even medical effects. It, by the way, 80% of those uh, noise complaints in the UK have to do with music. So when we think of something that's an assumed good like music, something we've been studying here, remembering there's sort of, as they put it, the dark side of that as well. People are affected by noise, so we shouldn't be terribly surprised that other species are as well. Another study I want to mention here is Irvine et al. They found that green spaces, that is, you know, relatively um, green spaces in a city, biodiversity, so the number of species and sort of the health of the ecosystem, ambient noise, measuring the amount of the decibels, the amount of noise that's there, and human spatial preferences, where people on a survey say they'd like to be at any given time in the city, that all those things co-vary independently showing that, in fact, all of these things are important and, and, and sound is one of those things that's very important to people, that they have a relative quietude in order to think, um, relax, and feel healthy. Probably the most interesting work in this regard, because it's affected policy um, to such a great extent, is Gordon Hempton's One Square Inch of Silence. It's a book written by a recording engineer who started gaining tinnitus in his ears after his entire life using headphones, and this is very common. Most people at some point get some hearing loss due to noise. And that led him to think about the ways in which noise relates to what we've defined as wilderness. You might remember in our conversation with Dan Philippon talking about the concept of wilderness. And he argues, that is Gordon Hempton argues, that if the loudest noises in that space are still human, then you don't really have what we tend to define as wilderness, a more natural space. And so you might think, well, that's not really an issue. I've been to Yellowstone, I've been to the Grand Canyon, I've been to these places, and it's relatively quiet and it's far away from any human development. Well, for example, when you look at the number of overflights over the Grand Canyon, and I'm going to pull this, this out of the air, but I believe it's something like two, over 200 a day, um, you will, and you study that soundscape, you will find that the loudest noise at almost all times is still human mechanical noise. In the case of Gordon Hempton, he lives in the, uh, near the Olympic National Rainforest and Park. And it's certainly the case there. Airplanes, mainly coming from SeaTac Airport, fly right over there on their way to um, Asian destinations and elsewhere. And therefore, there's a lot of noise in the Olympic National Rainforest and the Olympic National Park. So his concept was this. If you have a few special places where you can get one square inch of silence, literally he takes a talisman out to the middle of the Olympic Rainforest and says, if you can measure and find that the noise there is mainly natural and animal, that as opposed to human noise, that you will have something approximating what we think of as wilderness. And he didn't just leave it at that. He actually went on a, um, a campaign to Washington, D.C. to try to convince national park officials and others to impose more stringent um, sound policies and to study this issue further, which they have done. And since that time, partly because of Gordon Hempton, uh, more stringent regulation has been put in place. A lot of more research is being done in public parks, including led by a team at, at Colorado State University. And it's become an issue that more people know about because of his best-selling book. So to summarize um, what I'm presenting here, um, sort of a mini summary here of what we know in terms of the science before we get to the summary for the lecture. We study anthropogenic noise typically by using um, simple um, measurements in, in a place, transects where we take them at a certain distance and over time, and we study the anthropogenic um, uh, noise itself, although we tend to study effects more than the noise itself. 
And then we see how it affects animal sound by making the same measurements, typically just looking at volume and frequency. But as Kite and Swaddle have pointed out, we really don't know much about physiological effects. In fact, we've, uh, more has been studied in terms of human physiological effects outside of acoustic ecology than for any other organism and physiological effects. So I've listed several ways in here that Kite and Swaddle um, uh, suggest might be affected by sound, but more research needs to be done. So that's from the neuroendocrine system all the way down to potential genetic effects of sound. And a lot of that is a, definitely a new frontier as far as studying the ways in sound affects species. So what can we do in the meanwhile? Because remembering using both the precautionary principle to say that this incipient research suggests that there's a very dramatic effects, including many species that probably can't ever compete or exist in an urban environment because of noise, that we should do something. And also just in terms of human preferences, uh, our own recognition that we want quieter environments and that matters to us. So what can we do? Well, one I would suggest is take a sound walk. A sound walk is guided by an expert who takes people along and they usually walk silently for a while and then discuss what they've heard and, and it's, it's facilitated discussion to think about and suddenly hear sounds that we might normally not hear in our day-to-day -day life. Um, there are people that guide these sound walks in various different contexts, mainly in cities. Um, for example, there are a couple of people that do it here in the Twin Cities. Uh, the person that I know best and, and I've taken his sound walks is Tyler Kinnear in the Vancouver, um, BC area. And I strongly re recommend taking a sound walk to first understand what are some of the sounds in your area. And of course you don't need expert guidance. You can just go out and do that yourself with your ears open or your recorder on. Also, um, as we've seen before, one of the best ways to get involved publicly is to go to a public scoping hearing or other public hearing that has to do with environment, including de uh, development plans. For example, here I offer a quote from one person at a, um, where they were talking about developing a new urban development along the Steelhead River. And he said, I'm concerned at the possibility of Steelhead turning into another Daroche a place where similar development had already taken place, where the citizens there are dealing with ongoing noise pollution. So just looking at the number of complaints shows that there can be a problem in terms of noise. And actually speaking up and registering that is important because once again, it's the thing that's often forgotten until it happens, until there's more train traffic or whatever through an area, people don't realize that sound would have also been an issue with that particular development, especially in residential areas. Finally, speaking of residential areas, there's not only sort of these wholesale policy level things that people do and can do and we can discuss, but also sort of retail level, things that we can do individually in the places where we live and um, recreate in order to decrease noise pollution. So for example, if you live in an area where um, there's lots of trees and it makes sense to have trees, uh, I'm not talking about the desert here, of course, but if we're in most of Minnesota, for example, planting trees um, can reduce noise pollution and therefore deforestation can increase it. So that's another way to think about um, dealing with sound. So I want to now summarize this fairly lengthy and more complex lecture about an issue that is not covered in the textbook, that is human disruption of animal communication. And to summarize, anthropogenic noise impacts at least some animals adversely. We know very clearly that anthropogenic noise, our own noise, impacts humans fairly adversely. But acoustic ecology is a relatively young field, so it's one in which we're just finding out some of these effects that have been supposed for quite a long time. And the precautionary principle suggests that we try to lessen the impact of noise, even in understudied cases where negative impact is a reasonable supposition. So we might use something like um, uh, blackbird as a, a signal species to say if we know it, it affects them, we can assume probably that other understudied species that also communicate this way might be affected by human noise. And then finally, there are steps we can take to lessen noise pollution via policy and practice.